Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Yes? Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah. First of all, thank you for attending this event. My name is uh, Donatella Della Ratta. I am an Associate Professor of Communications and Media Studies at John Cabot University, which is the place that is hosting this uh, inspiring, I hope, <laughs> event. Um, uh, at the Communication Department at the John Cabot University, we have been running the Digital Delights and Disturbances uh, lecture series for almost three years now. Uh, we started back in uh, 2019 uh, hosting people like uh, Lawrence Lessig and uh, Paul B. Preciado in what is now uh, known as in presence talk, something that uh, looks like belonging to the past. Uh, then we had to freeze an edition for uh, due to COVID, of course, uh, and uh, the lockdown. And uh, we came back last year with a lineup of hybrid events, uh, so partially in person and partially online. And experiments such as Queer Dada and Video Vortex that were hosted half in presence, half remotely, and in presence they were hosted by the only person who could not respect, who could dare not to respect social distancing, which is our robot uh, Komi. Um, so today uh, it's a kind of exceptional talk for digital delights and disturbances, at least for two reasons. Uh, first one is the format, which is a lecture performance, uh, uh, definitely much more lyrical and poetic than analytical and academic. I know a lot of people understand academic as boring, you know, so that's definitely not the case. It's going to be poetic, lyrical and not boring, I grant you. Uh, this follows the line of what we have done with Queer Dada last March. Uh, queer Dada was a marathon of queer writers uh, where we had the pleasure to host uh, a short poetic performance by Drew Pham, who is our main guest today and whom I had the pleasure to meet uh, through Mackenzie work. Uh, uh, her work is always inspiring. And uh, in one of her talks, I, I get to know uh, Drew. So thank you all also so much to Mackenzie work for, for uh, featuring people like uh, Drew. Uh, in our events. Um, so the second reason why this is kind of exceptional today um, is the topic we're going to deal with, because usually in this lecture series, uh, we, we talk about uh, algorithmic cultures, uh, surveillance, uh, all things digital, uh, but never about war, you know. Uh, but actually today, war has definitely indeed become, uh, become digital. Uh, in the sense that is uh, ideologically, of course, uh, just ideologically believed to be immaterial, surgical, harmless, uh, with no side effects, uh, no casualties, no collateral damages. Uh, and that's the ideology of the drone warfare, for, for example. Uh, war has become digital also because of its uh, hypermediation. Uh, we consume it on our screen uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we scroll down death and destruction, sometimes horrified and sometimes bored also for the ways in which the show repeats itself on our screens. Uh, so war is definitely a, a media phenomenon, a digital hyper-connected and networked event. So of course it fits uh, uh, within the, the, the kind of path that we are developing here with digital delights and disturbances. Um, but today, I grant you, our host will be dealing with the, quite the opposite, in fact, of this uh, digital war. Uh, uh, she will be dealing with the very organic part of war, an embodied spectacle of masculinity performed on the ground over defenseless bodies. Uh, Drew has a very exceptional experience of war, as you will see in their lecture performance, uh, both for being a child of war refugees from Vietnam, and therefore embedding war within their own body and flesh and blood and genes, uh, but also for being or having been once uh, a US Army captain stationed in Afghanistan. 
so an experience from which uh, they returned very much changed, uh, as you will see, both in their bodies and in their soul, of course. Uh, so this lecture performance is not based on a second hand experience, media stories or, or desk research, but on Drew's own experience of Vietnam and Afghanistan in body, flesh, bones and soul. I hope you will enjoy the, this exceptional speaker uh, who was once upon a time a part of it, the US military and is now uh, an amazing, inspiring human being and queer poet teaching, creating writing in New York City and doing so many other inspiring things. Uh, so I wanna leave the floor to Drew. Uh, they will tell us a bit more about the project of fragmentary memory uh, which is the title of today's talk, uh, before getting into the core of the live performance, uh, uh, after which, uh, if you stay with us, we'll be happy to have you joining a Q&A and uh, take your questions either from the chat or if you prefer also on camera and voice. So thank you and uh, let me welcome Drew once again. Thank you, Drew, for being with us today. Of course. Thank you, Donatella. So like most writers, I'm very awkward about talking about my own work. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, growing up as the child of war refugees and then feeling this kind of great compulsion to understand why my family had suffered in the ways that it had, understand why I as a child wasn't getting the kind of care that I saw my um, peers getting from their parents, um, I, I had to ask this question around what war's effects were. And, and ultimately, in a way, it drove me toward joining the military in, in addition to a bunch of material, very real material concerns, like the need for an education and for a job. Um, <clears throat> but in encountering kind of texts about Vietnam, about that conflict, um, people like me were always absent, be it in Hollywood films that were purportedly anti-war to even um, critic critically acclaimed texts like um, Yusuf Kamenyakia's uh, Ding Kai Dao and um, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. I saw a great measure of empathy and um, care in those texts, but not necessarily the kind of voice and energy um, that you know i saw it like the the kind of voice and energy that comes out of uh full personhood for in this case vietnamese people when i came went to afghanistan and returned um on returning i encountered a very similar phenomenon where Afghan people were often used as props, used, seen as kind of an abstract group in the same way that Vietnamese had. Um, during this time, I was also struggling with my own like um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, the struggles inside my own family, um, and this really hard adjustment period. So I became a writer and uh, in an effort to try and um, navigate these issues. Um, so I deal with two primary kind of motivating factors uh, for this particular project. Um, one was to um, deal with trauma in the way that I had experienced it personally. And that is always through this kind of fragmentation of memory. So there's also this fragmentation of meaning that occurs. But on top of that, something that I sought to do was to give voice to those who are traditionally voiceless. Um, and in that project, I kind of turned to Mikhail Bakhtin's concept of polyphony in writing, which is the use of many voices. So combining these fragmentary memories along with the many voices that are necessary to reach the emotional truth um, that I seek, uh, in my own writing, um, I hope to uh, achieve this often sought after goal of many fiction, prose and poetry writers of familiarizing that which is unfamiliar and defamiliarizing that which is deeply familiar. So with that, I'll go ahead and begin uh, my performance of the text. <clears throat> One, woman, 
Her cousin Hui returned, a lone medal on his chest with the insignia of a Zhonghui on his collar. She found him in the square one day, sitting at a folding desk, marshalling a new group of conscripts to go south and fight. His eyes were distant. She invited him to come home, have dinner with the family, but he made no indication he heard. But in the evening, she saw him walking down the road in the dark. He'd brought a carton of cigarettes to give to her father, American Salem's, the kind that Bakho liked. They ate and drank in the dark, in silence, except for Kang's brother, Ling. How many Americans did you kill, cousin? He asks. We didn't answer for a long time. Then, as the conversation began to revive, he rubbed the boy's back. You're asking the wrong question, he said. On an ambush, we shot the legs from under this pillar of a black Yankee. His friend, this pink boy, ran from cover to rescue him, and we cut him in half, too. They both died in each other's arms. Hui took Ling's hand, squeezed it hard. You should be asking what kind of country sends their boys here to die like that. Ling wriggled free from his cousin's grasp and hid behind his mother. No one said anything for the rest of the night. That was for the best because Kaing wished she could feel something for those American boys, but she couldn't. Maybe if a million of them had died, two million, three million, she might, but not for those two. We drank until he swayed, until he slurred and stumbled and passed out. While her sisters cleared the table, Kaing dragged him into the next room, lay a cloth over his head, arranged the mosquito netting around his body, and burned a coil of camphor. As she undressed him, she saw his flesh was pocked and marred with scars. One looked like a giant brush stroke across his chest. It was dark and wept pus, appearing like it might never fully heal. So she dressed it with a cloth. And when she went to bed, she did not allow herself to cry. Not for her cousin, not for her beloved love who'd gone south and died, not even for herself and the future that had slipped from her fingers. Her sleep was a shallow sleep, and she woke to Hui's screams, shivering the walls. She entered and saw that Hui had torn through the mosquito net, and his wound seemed to glow hot on his skin. He cried and bored holes into the walls with his fists. The house shook, and she refused to allow herself to cry. The next day, the conscripts assembled. They marched south rifles on their shoulders, helmets on their heads. There were no flowers this time, no singing, only Hui marking time with his deep voice. The families placed photographs of the departing soldiers, their children among the dead ancestors on the family altars. Kang went home and found a note left on the bed she shared with her sisters and brother. The approximate location of her soldier's grave she folded it into her pass card, put, put it in the pocket over her heart. She wouldn't cry, she decided, going into the kitchen for a pair of shears. She cut her long black hair to hang just below her cheekbones. The American bombing campaign started anew days later, when the drums and bells alerted the factory workers and farmers and students, when the people welcomed the incoming Vs of jets, those F-4 Phantoms and A-4 Skyhawks and B-52 Strato Fortresses, with a hail of shells and bullets and missiles, she went out into the fields, donned her steel helmet. There were roads to repair, shelters to dig, guns to bear, she let her lotus petal skin yellow and darken in the sun like paper set to flame. She made the revolution her lover, knowing that in time it too would spurn her. Kang did not speak her sweetheart's name again for the rest of the war. Two, father. A 16-year-old boy watched the shores of his homeland recede into the ocean on the 30th of April. 
Diesel exhaust from the thrumming engine of that landing craft overpowered everything but the festering waves and the aircraft ferrying overhead like, lo like lines of ants in the sky. The flat bottom boat's occupants were packed shoulder to shoulder, jostling with the waves. Something sloshed on the steel deck, its foul odor cutting through the fumes from time to time, but the boy did not want to look down. The U.S. 7th Fleet rose on the horizon, grew and grew into cliff sides. The teenager peered over the lip of the landing craft that ferried him to the warships. There was no profit to part the waters, so thousands made their exodus aboard machines of war. Like jumpers, the bodies of helicopters tumbled off carrier decks and droves, consumed by the hungry brine beneath. The boy was alone. His whole family left behind. He'd lost contact with his brother when the communists had taken his airbase. His mother had died when he was still a young child. His father, a tall, handsome army colonel, did not and would not join him. He had his duty as a doctor and remained at his ad hoc post, so the boy was truly alone. Vung should have known some, felt something. He wanted to feel something, but since the communists had reached the outskirts of Saigon, everything had split apart. The weeks and days and hours and minutes careened away, and he was helpless to them. The landing craft didn't take him to a heaving, gun-bristled warship, but to a shipping vessel pressed in to assist the evacuation. The elderly had to be lifted by winch onto the deck. Everyone else climbed a wood and rope ladder. The landing craft, which had brought them away, was left abandoned. There were already hundreds there, their luggage crowding the deck. Suitcases and TV sets and caged chickens and even motorbikes were lashed to the railings so as to make space for more refugees. For days, they languished on the decks through the heat of the sun and buckets of filth that filled up too quick and the stench of defeat effusing off their bodies. Vaughn couldn't sleep, but when he tried, it was with his belly over his satchel to guard the slab of, slab of money his uncle had given him. In the night, people fucked desperately or fought desperately or simply sobbed. He thought he must be like his father, Stolid, firm, unmovable. If he was here, he would go about his duties, attend to the sick and injured, offer guidance to the lost, all without complaint, without self-pity. But Vung wasn't a doctor, nor was he his father, so all he could do was try and channel the man to calm himself. He knew he needed to get back to his father, refuse to be like these bitter, desperate people around him. After nearly a week, the ship finally made berth in Subic Bay. The thousands of refugees debarked. From there, they boarded planes to the little island of Guam. A whole city of green waxed canvas had been erected prior to their arrival, stretching up and down the airstrip. The boy kept to himself, went nowhere without a satchel, checked hourly, discreetly, that his uncle's money remained within. He ate the flavorless American food, swallowing out of necessity, not understanding how a whole country could live on such cud, except they ate so much meat. He approved of that in those blue cans of Spam. Others weren't so tolerant, Generals and deputy ministers became ad hoc restaurateurs and tailors and shopkeeps. A few relished the work. Many did not. It was strange for him to see men who'd stood in the reviewing stands at parades, now ladling airsat soup into dried pasta. Yet they all appeared committed to a common project again, having no one to exploit or backstab or fight. All these fallen dignitaries were already trying to remake the home they'd lost. Vuong couldn't settle for such pale substitutes like the pho they made using spaghetti noodles and chicken bones thrown out by the mess sergeants. Others prayed for Providence to guide them all back home, attending mass every week and confessing as often as was possible in the Green Army Cathedral. Like the Israelites, the priest said, they too would return from exile and into the kingdom of God. 
Vuong stopped attending mass after he'd heard that for the fifth time. They'd never get anywhere rehashing the past. Summer was nearly over when he received his resettlement assignment. He was an un unaccompanied minor, thus a special case. The charity workers told him he wouldn't go to the camps in San Diego or Arkansas or Florida or Pennsylvania. As the caseworker spoke, Vung tried the slippery new words under his breath. San Diego, Arkansas, Florida, Pennsylvania. Thankfully, he knew a little English now, which had made him made finding a foster home for him easier. A nice family in Vancouver, in Canada. Vancouver. Vung nodded along with his caseworker, took his papers, waited for the next few weeks for the arrangement to be finalized. He'd made up his mind already, though. He'd get back home. Peace would come, and when it did, he'd return to his father. Three, child. She had been named David Min Tran, the auspicious firstborn boy to the eldest child in her family. She had been born a girl and given a name that did not fit, so replaced it with D, a name that only her friends used. She'd been given a place in the family hierarchy that did not suit and lived in a country that did not love her because of her skin and what lay beneath that skin in her unconquered heart. She had always liked playing with dolls, liked the friendship of other girls over the boys she'd been nudged to roughhouse with, and would always stare in the mirror wondering why she never felt that reflection ever read true. She had never simply been a girl. How can any man, woman, or anyone of any gender be entirely and only one thing? But she remembered when he came for her. Like a spirit, like a spirit, like a guardian angel, like a shield, like the uncertain and desperate grasping for meaning that is a mixed metaphor, she remembered needing him. She had been a child, that much she remembered, though the exact age escaped her. She remembered her father, that man who'd smelled of the past, of desperation and longing. She remembered his firm grasp on her hair, the bruising grip on her arm, and the rough pressure of palms pressing down on her hips. She remembered pain, so much pain, and not much else. She remembered when the boy came and took her hand, this child named David, this auspicious firstborn boy whose name fit, who did his filial duty and loved the country that had given him and his family freedom, though what freedom meant, she did not know. But what he offered wasn't freedom, but defense. Defense that her slim wrists and love of soft things could not provide. Defense from the rupture rending her each time she peered into the mirror. Defense from men and the things they do to girls. He offered her a body that would take blows for her. One that would carry her when she was too weak to go on. One that would fight for her. Like so many young girls and women, she accepted his hand without really understanding what she'd agreed to. He would give her all the things he promised. He would even love her and then eventually leave her when the time came. But he gave her other things. He gave her rage. He gave her aggression. He gave her a sword that he convinced her she needed, one whose grip would not loosen for many years. She would go through life, through the breadth and length of this story, thinking she needed David more than anyone else. But in the end, the truth was he needed her more than she ever needed him. Four, Bacha Push, dressed as a boy. Again, Zahid, the boy, and Sobia, the girl, sit with one another in the heart that they share. I couldn't stand up to him, Zahid says. The tears fall hot on Sobia's cheek. I couldn't stop Afshak. He went to the Talib. He betrayed our trust. People could have died. 
Hush now. Sobia strokes the boy's hair, pulls him in closer. I need you to be strong. I'm not strong. I need you to be calm. How can I be calm? She releases him, looks him up and down. I need you to be a man. Do you hear me? She wrenches away from him, grabs his collar, pushes him back. Zahid, do you hear me? I hear you. What did I say? To be strong. What else? And to calm myself. What else? Say it. Zahid. I can't. I don't feel it. How can I feel that way with you shouting at me? I'm not shouting. Now say it. I'm not. I'm not. How can I say I'm something? I'm not. Say it. I need to be a man. You can do better than that. Tell me what you are. I'm a man. Louder. I'm a man. You sound like a scared little girl. Louder. I'm a man, all right? His cheek burns before he realizes he's been struck. Her brow is furrowed and tangled in anger. Louder! I'm a man. But deep down, they both carry a seed of doubt. Seeds the mullah planted, the soldiers, the men in the bazaar, the mujahids, the people on the radio, the authors of their precious books of poetry. Their brother planted this doubt, their mother, their dearly, dearly beloved and disappeared father. They remember the warmth of their skin on their parents' skin, their first Nauruz, their first Eid, the few happy weddings in the village, the farmhand smiling after the work is done and the sun is down, the face of a pretty girl with a pail of water on their head or a bundle of sticks in their arms. They remember spring, how everything blooms from the melted snows and dormant soil. These memories are populated with people and their passions and flaws and joys and violences. Joys mixed with sadness, then dread, then anger. They remember who they'd been told to be and this seed entangles them. Tendril vines around their wrists and ankles. This mask of vines coils around their necks and mouths and eyes and they remember fear too many times to recount, but strong enough to have made the future a black hole, so unknowable and relentless and infinitely empty. How can they believe themselves when they say who they are and who they are not? Five, soldier. A boy runs across your sight line. He has a rifle. It's old. Looks like a deer gun more than anything else. Your instinct is to shoot, and you do, but he falls before the, the bang and the bullet passes over his head. And you watch him stumble up. He looks at you. You've never seen one up close, the enemy that is. He's younger than you, but not by, not by much. Not the way you'd picture a terrorist. He doesn't even have a beard, doesn't scowl, doesn't shout Allahu Akbar. He doesn't put his hands up either, so he's fair game. You could do it. Part of you wants to. But he shakes his head, those brown irises of his encircled by a wide band of white. The boy can't, the boy can't swing his weapon around in time. He doesn't look like he would if he could. You're aiming for setter mass aiming to put two in his chest. You know what a bullet does to a man, how something so small can move so fast, how it bounces off bone and yaws through tissue, how it forces open a cavity in flesh, shocking all the organs, all in a split second. You have them dead, dead, dead to rights. You'll decide in a moment, you'll act. You'll do what you do because it's how the army trains you or because you're a man and you don't need to prove it anymore, or you're tired of being a component of an end item with its own damn serial number, Delta Alpha Hotel 1260. 
You'll do it because of a woman you hardly know and the shushing Yellowstone River and a photograph signed to remember me by instead of love. Say you take him prisoner. They'll spirit him away to some dark and lonely place. Maybe they'll do things you heard about on TV. Things you know are torture, but technically are not. Maybe someone will drop him out of a helicopter, or line him up against a wall, or beat him hard enough he bleeds on the inside and doesn't wake up in the morning. Or maybe nothing will happen. They'll see him for what he is, a scared kid with a rifle in his hands. Say you shoot him. Isn't that what all soldiers want? You be a hero, and everyone will slap you on the back, and you'll carry that reputation with you forever. And if you do it, if you snuff the boy's life out, wouldn't that make you into what you'd always wanted to be? A soldier soldier? Maybe it'll be an act of mercy in the end. Maybe you won't have to go on living in this shit place, fighting this shit war. And maybe you'll spare him from incarceration or torture or worse. But you won't know who you are anymore. A dead boy will suck all the air out of you. And nothing will ever survive in that vacuum. Say you let him go. It might come back on you. You'd be a traitor. Or you'd be dead as soon as you show mercy. Worse. You might kill one of your buddies, and then you have that weight around your neck forever. But say you let him go, and he runs off into the mountains. You like to believe he'd think hard about the rifle in his hands, the choices he's made. You like to think that he, like you, sees a little of himself in a stranger. And maybe this is nothing, just a passing moment like stopping short before a pedestrian dashes into the intersection, thinking if you ha hadn't hit the brakes, maybe both of your lives would have changed forever. You could let him go and say nothing to your sergeants who are too distracted and say nothing to the officers when they shake your hand. And maybe when you get out of this man's army and try to rebuild your life in the place it started, no one will have to know a damn thing. You could go back. Find Joan. Her hair will be short, shorn down to the elegant curves of her skull. She'd be a graduate student. You return her book, maybe have some coffee and talk. Maybe, just maybe, it could be more than just a little fun. You'll kiss her and mean it, and she'll kiss you and mean it. You'll follow each other across the country to places you've only ever seen in the movies. You'll see how big America is, the redwood forests and frozen plains and sprawling cities. Maybe you'll discover for all your country living, you're a city boy at heart. Let's say you settle someplace with a name everyone knows. You'd always wanted to see New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. Joan had worked days, maybe at a nonprofit helping people. You like the idea of that. You go back to school at nights and because of those hours, spent apart, you'd fight because no couple doesn't, but you remember your mama working three jobs and you'll know what kind of what that kind of despair looks like. And you'd never inflict that on anyone. You make it work and in the end it'd pay off and you find yourself a career. You don't know it yet, but you'll want to do something with books. You imagine yourself as a teacher, your hands perpetually covered in chalk telling your students how they came late to reading, how you came late to reading and writing, but you have faith they'll grow because they're here and you, you see yourself in them. You'll have children one day who'll grow smart like their mama and maybe they'll have a son who never grows into a big man, but maybe he'll want to prove he can be one, he comes home with an enlistment contract for you to sign because he's 17 and too young to sign on his own. You'll sit your son down and tell him about a village in Afghanistan and the decision you had to make. You'll say you had to be, you've been where he wants to go and there isn't room for love over there. You'd been 18 back then and a kid with a rifle ran across your sight line. You could have killed him, but you spared his life because you saw yourself in someone else. Because you saw, you knew the measure of a man isn't what other boys and football coaches and the army says it is. You tell him if you hadn't, 
you'd have turned into a man you knew once, someone who'd pinned his life to an army at war, someone who'd always known, you'd always known was afflicted with a deep sadness. If you'd killed that boy in Afghanistan, you never would have gone back to Montana and found his mother, never would have found, followed her out to the big city, the only home your boy knows, and never had him. All because in a split second, you'd made a choice. But for all the things that could be, all those futures you might live, you've made your choice. The trigger of your rifle gives against the tip of your finger, then breaks. The muzzle yelps and your weapon recoils against your shoulder. As the rifle's bolt slips another round into the chamber, as the recoil spring eases and loosens against your jaw, you'll know there's no going back. Six, poet. I'd like to write a poem, if only a spare line or two, to the widows among our number. When the men die, we entear them before the sun comes down and we place winnowing green and white banners above their burial mounds as signs of their faith and piety. I'd like to include an image of those banners, not out of sorrow for the lost men, but as a question. Will they fly a red banner when the widow is remarried to an old man? It doesn't roll off the tongue, not yet. Anyway, how does one express at once the loss of a husband and the freedom from him? The images we hold in our heads are still too vivid, an imbalance between the metonymy and lyric of the verse. And we are too close to the subject, having felt loss far too often. Someday the lines will come. But to write of the cemetery, I must write about our town, a village really, those ancestors who'd sought refuge in the forest of mountains, in the fortress of mountains surrounding this place, deserve a few words as homage. Perhaps something evocative, something mourning the fact that those ancestors may not be waiting for us in paradise. They were Kufar, who never knew the prophet's words, peace be upon him and yet we're grateful for their gift. I'll write of the, how the cold mountain springs glow blue when the snow caps melt and bleed like a slaughtered lamb and fill our riverbeds, though this image is worrisome, blending beauty with violence. It's hard these days to divorce one from the other. The old village had a beautiful domed mosque, high walled compounds, a market, a school, it had stood for hundreds of years, perhaps a thousand, before the last war made all that rubble. We rebuilt around the ruins of the old, but those lost masons and their plums and chisels and mallets, but lost those masons and their plums and chisels and mallets ages ago. In this, we can lament what was once beautiful, what was once prosperous, along with what is now only brutal and bloody and eviscerating. What did our forebears fight for all those years? Simple things, our orchards and terraced fields, the children we raise, the way the sun plunges itself onto the blade of the stone peaks, that beauty is enough to carry us through the harsh winter. The men take up arms when the spring comes and fight into the summer. Those seasons bring two harvests, one of the earth, the other of our flesh. Autumn, on the other hand, is sweet for the perfumed trees and their yield. Some of us would like a whole year of autumn, not too cool, not too hot, if such a thing were possible. A fighting season that perpetually ends and never begins. To write of the violence with which we are so well acquainted, we would have to write about the soldiers. Soldiers have always come here, further into the past than any of us can remember. These men from foreign lands sometimes come by truck or in the bell bellies of treaded troop carriers in tanks and helicopters at night on the backs of Mongol horses. And we have heard on elephants, though this is shrouded in myth and seems far-fetched. What conveys them to us? They inevitably 
what conveys to them them to whatever conveys them to us they inevitably dismount their transports fall into tight ranks arrowhead formations or piked squares or simply a frothing rabble they have come for many reasons, to sate a general's ambition, to claim an empire, to spread their revolutions or the word of God, or perhaps they simply see a village set apart from the others and just out of grasp, a tantalizing prize or threat. When the soldiers arrive, we watch them gather at the eastern mouth of our little valley, leading into our huddled homes. Our men gather too, as is their custom, and march up the mountains to where their we weapons are hidden. And we are left alone with the old men and children who are poor company when the fighting inevitably begins. How do you encapsulate the feeling of being left behind, of being powerless to what follows? Easy to describe, but difficult to relate. Perhaps a simile, like seeing your sister married and not knowing if her husband will be cruel or kind, missing the warmth of her on your shared mattress, missing her smile, her laugh, her foul moods. Is this how it is where you are from? How you feel when your men come to our country? We women watch your men in their armored trucks and carapaces of bulletproof vests and helmets, and like a woman who's seen her sister wed, we hope for a little kindness, to be reunited with our kin one day, and that these strange men will not become murderers. Seven, enemy. This is the memory that stays with him as his blood abandons the body and life fades. This is the one comfort that will carry him into the next life. Gavron had waited beneath a mulberry tree in May of last year. He'd come to love mulberries in a small way. They'd always kept him company through the boredom of waiting. It was still cool in the mornings and evenings, the breeze shaking the branches, dropping the still tart clustered berries. So strange that trees bearing fruit must sacrifice their children to live. How an animal carries that seed away the length of a kilometer, a province, a nation, to plant and bloom again. In this way, the child's sacrifice meant something, and he'd like that. He remembered Zafar's simple house, not more than a small compound with a low wall and one building, one shed. The gate opened, Zafar standing there in the vestibule with his daughter propped up on his hip. The dim outline of a woman behind them. A handsome woman and child. Zafar put the girl down, kissed her once on each cheek, on the forehead and on both cheeks again. He turned to his wife and the woman smiled. The sight of Zafar's family brought Davran thoughts of the future, of blooming. At least that's how he likes to remember it a smiling wife, a doted upon child, things he'd hoped to have one day, but never would. Safar took him up into the mountains where they would, could see the whole valley. They took a small bag, some naan, dried fruits and nuts, rice. They had work to do, checking vantage points, watching the Americans and the government troops and the police drawing up maps of the improvements the Americans had made to their little outpost. These soldiers were tired or lazy or scared, so they rarely ventured out, and the summer that followed was as quiet and peaceful as anyone could hope. Before they began their descent down the mountain, a pair of shepherds came across their path, offered them a little food and tea, they sat in a little basin in the foothills where the soil had accumulated over the years from all the se sediment washed down from snow melts. While the flock grazed or huddled or slept, the men sat around the fire, telling tall tales, reciting couplets of poetry and resuscitating dead memories. They ate, drank tea, watched the half disc moon crawl up the sky, trading places with the sun. The insects in the valley 
below sang their song, torch flies lit the marshy canal beds and mountain streams. A stray dog howled, and Aran felt himself fortunate for his belly now full with warm meat and gravy. He remembered being thankful for Zafar, who'd always been a patient eater, methodical, careful, and Davran loved watching his mouth take some things whole, tear other things off in small bites, and seeing the thin film of grease form his lips reflecting a little of all that moonlight. In the dark, his commander's skin seemed more like polished stone than flesh. More than that, he loved listening to Zafar speak. Zafar told a story about a book his father had brought back from Russia, about a giant fish and the mad fisherman who'd pursued it. We do such insane things for love, he'd said, tracing the outlines of the man's mad seaman's obsession. He said it was love that had driven him to madness, that he'd loved the enormous fish, for it was the fish that gave him life. It was the fish that had given him purpose. Davran remembers all the questions he'd had of the strange tale, questions that, when he gazed at Zafar, he seemed to already know the answers. He had thought that he had thought on that while the meal warmed his belly and the fire dried the sweat from his clothes. Love deriving from purpose comforted him. It meant he could say he loved Zafar, this man who'd given him purpose, given his life meaning, and he'd learn how far that ins and he would learn how far that insane love would take him, but he'd stay loyal. He he would slaughter a fat landlord with a knife, bomb his countrymen, and in his last living moments watch his beloved commander flee the field, but he remains above all things loyal. Even with the moon, they'd climbed high enough not to want to risk broken bones on their descent, so they spent the night there, camped with the shepherds around their little fire. They had only one blanket, Zafar's, and Avran was happy to let him have it despite the night's chilly air. But the man told him not to be foolish. It was common practice for fighters, indeed common practice among soldiers everywhere, to make spoons of their bodies and nestle close to share heat. Davran assented, curled himself into his commander's embrace, his body like that of an infant in the womb, and listened to Zafar's st strong, steady breath took in his musk smelling of damp soil and leather and burnt powder and fell drowsy to the steady metronome of Zafar's heart against his ribs. They slept the whole night through, neither man moving a centimeter from the other. Through every challenge, every moment of doubt, every difficult choice, Davran remembers this night above all other nights. When the rooster woke the morning, Zafar shook Davran awake. Soon they heard the Meuzin in the valley below singing the call to prayer. The two stood side by side, knelt in unison, their bodies bending as one, and on their lips the name of God. Eight, refugee. I repeat the American's words, the regrets of his government that he will do what he can ha do, he will do what he can to help. But that collateral damage, mistakes, are an unfortunate consequence of the American presence here. Abdul is silent. He lowers himself to the ground, crossing his legs. He rests his head on his father's body. The villagers' voices gather, darken. Lieutenant David's men bristle with their rifles to their shoulders. The, the villagers say things I should be used to hearing by now. The Americans are liars. The Americans have come here and promise everything, but they are liars. The Kfar are dogs, they say. They say I'm a traitor. They call me a homosexual, a drunkard, a dog's whore. Sergeants Finley and Clayson shout, stop, get back. And Abdul 
He says things I'm also used to hearing. No, he says, no, no, no. He holds his hands up, but they can't hear him. I've heard these things from children and wives watching their brothers and husbands arrested. They say this to soldiers breaking down their doors. They say this over the bodies of their kin. I've heard all these things enough times to lose count. And they've never hurt, but I feel it now that hurt. The soldiers won't turn their backs on the villagers as they walk out of the Kalat. The villagers follow, apparently unafraid. Sergeant Finley grabs me, pulls me behind him. The soldiers walk backward through the narrow alleys, under the tree shade, past the gates and gardens and homes. No, 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 I hear Abdul still saying. Honorless, they call me. Traitor, they call me. I want to rip off my mask and my uniform. I want to wade into the angry mob. I want them to mangle me as starved dogs do, to take my life as payment for the dead man's. But Sergeant Finley keeps his arms stretched out, holding me back. In the morning, I pack my things. It's still dark, and even the Mayuzin haven't woken the call, woken to call the valley to pray. My bag is light. I take little compared to what I leave behind. On my cot, my folded uniform, my identification card, my bulletproof vest, my army boots, things which used to protect me. On top of the neat pile is my mask. I'll never wear one again. I leave behind my visa application, fat with letters and certificates, each adorned with signatures from grateful men, a history of a career interpreting their good intentions, their half-truths, their lies. I don't think I'll ever see California. Never eat an In-N-Out cheeseburger. I'll never teach Persian poetry to American students. I abandon other things I've come to love, to covet, those promised freedoms of life and liberty and the vague assurance that an American can chase happiness all he likes. I step outside into the moonless dark. I'll walk the eight kilometers to the provincial capital. From there, take a bus to Kabul where my wife and child wait. We'll have to leave the country. I think of Europe where I might seek asylum I might make a life there one day, find some school where I might teach Persian, but before that will ever happen, there will be hungry years and I'll have to live that migrant's life. And the road will be hard, crossing seas and deserts on boats and buses. I'll have to trek across my bleeding country before that, See the mountains and valleys recede from view and sink on the horizon. My country, through which every religion has passed, which great civilizations touch, which each great civilization has touched, my unconquered nation, this continent's crossroads, I have to leave behind. My phone buzzes. I know who it is. The men in their black turbans. What they ask. They tell me I could be a hero. I could be a martyr for them. But would my countrymen love me then? Would I redeem every half truth, every lie? Perhaps I am what so many villagers have called me, honorless, a traitor. Or I might remain loyal to the soldiers who've promised me so much and failed every single time. The minor birds serenade one another above me. They fly unbothered by the soldiers and civilians, holy warriors and clerics, the cowards, the traitors, the liars, the martyrs, and all their little human concerns. If God loved me, he would make, he would have made me a bird so I might fly away from this valley and over the mountains and across the deserts to a place where I owe no man allegiance. 
Thank you. That's um, that's the conclusion of my my piece. <laughs> well, uh, Drew, I know we are in a Zoom room, and uh, so it sounds uh, awkward. But if we were in a theater, uh, looking at you, watching this performance unfolding, uh, you would deserve a big clap for <laughs> for what you have done. Um, it's extremely difficult to convey, you know, feelings through this uh, gallery view on Zoom, quite flat. Uh, but I hope that the other participants today were able to to feel the magnetism of your words and your personality as much as I felt it uh, since actually the very first time I saw you at uh, Mackenzie's event. Um, so I I just wanna be the icebreaker here. I do not want to monopolize the conversation. Actually, I would like uh, to invite the other people to uh, join me in asking uh, questions or, or simply maybe, I don't know, give feedback, uh, comments to, to Drew, uh, either through the chat or you just, you know, uh, make yourself visible and uh, you can ask on camera or on voice if you prefer. Um, so I want to just be the icebreaker and ask the first thing. There are so many things that uh, uh, we could uh, touch upon after this powerful uh, text, but I, I shall start by something because you, you did mention in your introduction um, uh, Bakhtin's idea of uh, polyphony. Uh, so to have many voices, uh, not just one. Uh, a diver diversity of uh, simultaneous uh, points of view and voices uh, over one event, uh, uh, which uh, calls into being also a decentered authorial view, uh, which you are offering through this uh, text, uh, not by chance call it fragmentary memory and uh, featuring so many voices from the poet to the refugee to the woman. Um, it's a very rich text. I think that, uh, I mean, uh, we are, you know, when it comes to wars, uh, um, we are used to uh, listen to accounts, especially from uh, media, but also from politics and politicians that uh, usually uh, works around, uh, work around the narrative of the binary. So it's usually us versus them, it's usually the good ones versus the bad ones. It's usually democratic countries versus terrorists. Uh, this is the narrative we are used to, I'm afraid, when it comes to war, especially in, in the past 20 years or so. Uh, but also, I think this connects with the, the binarism uh, or the binary logic that we are uh, very much uh, familiar with when it comes to gender. You know, so there is always that just two genders like uh, men versus woman and uh, nothing else is possible. So this idea of like uh, na this narrative of the binary is very much present in our daily life from war account to our own sexual life. Um, and I'd like to recall uh, a short piece from uh, from uh, the text that you have read uh, uh, that you were so like powerfully reading uh, uh, some minutes ago. Um, and it comes from Basha Posh, uh, the, the excerpt. Uh, when you say, tell me who you are, I am a man, say it out louder, I am a man. And then you conclude by saying, how can they believe themselves uh, when they say who they are and who they are not? You know, so that's a powerful stance again uh, against this, uh, um, binary logic, this narrative of the binary. So um, I'd like you to reflect upon this uh, issue, if you can, uh, also because your own experience as a poet, as a writer, but also as, uh, uh, as a transgender woman uh, recalls this. I mean, it uh, stands in stark opposition with this logic of, of the binary, which is so difficult to overcome when it comes to such a masculine context as warfare is. Yeah, I mean, um, thinking about polyphony, like the emotional truths of these conflicts of the people who have to endure them, 
um, they can't be uniform. They can't exist only um, between um, only in one pole or the other. And um, I, it, by that same logic, to reach that truth, one can't talk about something like war without talking about sexuality, the ways in which militaries try to regulate such like um, sexuality um, from the use of sex workers in earlier eras or for some people still um, to like sexuality itself, how in many ways, like the military is the site of a great deal of homoeroticism to kind of like these political ends that we'd um, stated when we invaded Afghanistan like, oh, well, this is for the women and how they're oppressed and how they're uh, kind of um, how like that is a justification for us to go and do all this violence. But the truth is, it's like, how can you talk about something like gender and make lip service to it without really acknowledging how difficult of a proposition gender is in the same way that fighting a war for peace is a quite difficult proposition. Um, ultimately, I don't really seek to like give an answer to this larger question, but rather like problematize and um, complicate this issue, especially around gender and sexuality, especially since like whether you like it or not, there are going to be transgender people around you, whether they're closeted or out or passing or whatever it may be, in the same way that they're queer and straight um, and other kind of, and like uh, uh, asexual uh, people out there, you can't talk about the, this kind of radical violence. You can't talk about death without talking about birth. You can't talk about birth without talking about sexuality. And what it all ends up amounting to in my mind, I hope, is um, that we enter, we're welcomed into a space of uh, better, under, maybe not better understanding, but being able to see ourselves. Um, because we don't traditionally think of the, um, the so-called Middle East, or in this case, Central Asia, as being a place where queer, pe queer people exist at all. But Bachaposh is uh, dressing a girl as a boy is, is a tradition that stretches back for hundreds of years. Um, transgenderism in general is like not something that is necessarily new. Um, and I don't know, I suppose in exploring this, there's also this element of humanizing um, people who you, I think in America at least, um, we don't necessarily see as being capable of having an independent sexuality like the fighter in um, the, the section titled Enemy. Um, and it's difficult, right, for us to assume um, that someone who is masculine, a, a soldier, a combat soldier, might be a closeted transgender person, or that uh, the boy you see in the market is, in fact, um, someone who carries a much more kind of non-binary and gender non-conforming identity inside of them. Um, and again, this goes back to one of my intentions of trying to familiarize that which is unfamiliar and defamiliarize that which is familiar. Um, and I hope that kind of creates uh, some degree of empathy, or at least an empathic imaginary. Thank you, Drew. Uh, I see there is a question on the chat by uh, Helton Levy. Helton, would you like to ask it directly or you want me to read it? Uh, could you please read that for me, please? Um, I have very bad sound where I'm okay. not right now. If you could, please. Thanks very okay. much. Sure, Elton. Okay, so Elton is asking, uh, uh, is there space for any sort of solidarity in the army? We saw so little of it regarding Chelsea Manning and others who kitted on bad terms. Um, so the military is much like... Um, 
if, if you want to think about the United States military, I would argue that it is just like the rest of America, only more so. So, um, you know, there are leftists. There are a lot of us in the military. There are a lot of queer people in the military. There are a lot of intellectuals in the same way that there are a lot of conservatives, um, but, and maybe a lot of people who are very committed to things like the global war on terror. Um, so in that way, it's quite diverse. Even the kind of racial makeup of the military reflects the growing diversity um, of the US military. But um, one of the things about the ways in which we're conditioned uh, is to kind of seek out this uniformity, which is functional. I mean, it has a necessity to it. And if there's an idea that someone might do something that would risk the collective, then yeah, of course, it's going to be a lot harder to find that solidarity. I happen to have met Chelsea Menning, who's also a friend of a few of my friends. And, um, you know, I think that we find our solidarity not in the larger military community. Um, I could talk to another cavalry scout. I could talk to another member of the 10th Mountain Division. I could um, talk to another army soldier rather than a Marine sailor or um, uh, I don't know what it's called anymore. Uh, now it's an airman, it used to be. Um, but all these different services, and I may not ever really find that kind of solidarity. You find that degree of solidarity where you are with the people that you serve with, and sometimes you don't. And sometimes it's deeply isolating. I felt deeply isolated, for example, when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, and I was in Afghanistan at that time. And one of my soldiers came out to me as a uh, bisexual. And I was so proud of him. I was so proud of him. Um, I really only wanted the best things for him, but because of my position in the military, I felt it would be a liability if people knew I was trans, if people knew I was queer. So I didn't say anything. Um, and in that way, you know, our jobs can be incredibly isolating. I mean, there's a reason why adjusting is so difficult when we get back home in some senses, because we don't have that fellowship of people around us who know what we're going through. But in another aspect, it might be how isolating the kind of moral compromise of going to war might be or um, one's own individual identity, either like for my soldier as a bisexual person, for me as a um, queer dyke and as, um, you know, for anyone else, uh, if there's any kind of part of them that might be seen as a liability to um, your combat effectiveness, then it's going to be hard to find that degree of solidarity. Outside of the military, it certainly exists. There's more freedom to be vocal. There's more freedom to um, uh, express your views and take action based on them. But maybe one good thing about the military is when we are in, we're really not allowed to engage in a political manner, which is why it was so shocking for me, for example, to encounter soldiers who had been indoctrinated by the far right. Then again, I shouldn't have been really all that surprised. The KKK, after all, had many Vietnam veterans when they attacked Vietnamese refugees in like Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana, um, killing many of us. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's really, really complex, Helton. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm starting to answer your question, but I think much of the solidarity that we wish we had in the military comes after. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, Elton also says thank you very much. Um, anyone else has uh, questions for Drew? Because otherwise I go ahead and ask uh, my questions, but uh, yeah. Uh, I'd like this to be a polyphony. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, Drew. I, it's such a moving hi. reading. My makeup just ran, so that's why I had to get off camera for a second. <laughs> Uh, I, I just would, would like you to say you. a little bit. Oh no, Mackenzie. 
you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if it's part of a larger work, a little bit about the the uh, the what that might be and what what elements of it we're we're hearing here. I don't know if you heard me or not. Drew, could you hear Mackenzie? Because you look like frozen. Hello, Drew. I think we have lost uh, Drew. <laughs> it's maybe the Wi Fi or. Uh, she got too emotional because of your presence, Mackenzie. <laughs> I, it, hey. it's, a question, it's a question I can ask privately anyway, if, if other people wanted to, to move on with that, but I, uh, I might want to know. Yeah, no, but the, the thing is that I think we lost uh, Drew. <laughs> I think we lost our speaker. <laughs> so <laughs> I think our connection is probably, I don't know, there's something in... Uh... I'm back. Oh, back. yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> ask your question again, Mackenzie. I didn't get it. Uh, I was just asking if the the work that you read is part of a larger work, and if you just say a little bit about, if so, what what the form of that is, and let's go. Uh, so when I was in graduate school, my ment all of my mentors made this horrible, did this horrible violence to me by recommending that I read all of these like tomes of works from Dostoevsky to um, Tolstoy to Melville. And because that's what I was reading, in a lot of ways that informed how I ended up shaping um, this project, which is, is a novel. Um, it, I'm still working on it. Um, it's still very much in progress. Um, but yeah, it, it is part of a novel and um, Again, I think my intentions are the same as with with this with this talk. Um, I wanted, I needed to bring all these voices together because when I started writing, I actually hadn't um, thought to become a novelist or a poet. Um, I was, I took photographs overseas with a film camera that my ex-wife had given me. And she, she taught me how to shoot um, 35 millimeter um, with like an SLR, six by six uh, range finder cameras and gave me a little titanium bodied point and shoot with a Zeiss lens on it, which is really excellent. And that's what I took a lot of photographs with. And she did that so that we would have a way of communicating without doing it verbally. And uh, when I came back, one of my photographer friends who teaches at Columbia um, looked at them and said, oh, well, these are really interesting. You should consider um, putting them together for like a little book or something. And so I was like, okay, that seems like a good idea. Um, and as I was doing that, another friend invited me to um, come to a writing workshop. And I thought I could write these little excerpts of kind of, of my experience. Um, but as time went on, I slowly became more and more frustrated with the form of nonfiction, with this kind of ad ne necessary adherence to the facts, um, because there's a lot that's kind of lost in translation. And on top of that, one of the bigger frustrations was um, I'd initially tried writing this from the perspective of someone whose identity wasn't necessarily clear. It could have been basically a white soldier. But as time went on, I incorporated my own heritage. And in doing that, I couldn't talk about my heritage without giving voice to my parents and my family members. Um, as I kept moving forward in the project, I discovered I really couldn't talk about the violence of that war and reflect um, the effects of the war, the American war in Afghanistan without involving kind of the voices of people I encountered. And at the time I was working at the International Rescue Committee as a caseworker, um, doing employment services and um, just doing regular casework. And I encountered more kind of Afghan interpreters as they started beginning to come to the country. Um, and so, so much of 
like the research I did came out of those conversations in addition to kind of the basic academic research. And then you can't talk about like Afghan civilians without talking about our opponents either, because in a lot of ways, being North Vietnamese, I mean, or from a North Vietnamese family, um, my mother is North Vietnamese, I have Ho Chi Minh tattooed on my chest. Um, it's impossible for me to talk about like Afghanistan or Vietnam and the people there without talking about our opponents either, especially since in many ways I felt that many of us actually felt that we could um, relate more to the Afghans who were fighting us to get us to leave their homeland than with the politicians who'd sent us there for political capital or for profit. It was really clear to us how much big business was entangled in the war, how um, these contractors who sat on their asses every day while we went out and, um, you know, wore down our bodies climbing the mountains and getting into firefights and all these really emotionally exhausting things, we would get paid, you know, from 20 to 45, 50, 60, if you're a, if you're a higher ranking officer, like 80 or $90,000 a, a year, while these, these contractors were making at least 100 grand a year and 90 grand of that was tax free. So yeah, we, we looked at, everyone was disillusioned. When bin Laden was killed, for example, we all asked each other, why aren't we going home? Isn't this what we wanted? But we stayed and we stayed for 10 more years. So um, yeah, I think that my road to there is like informed by a lot of, a lot of questions that around identity, that around sexuality, that around kind of the material conditions that war brings about. Um, so yeah, I'm, I hope, and, I, and that's something that I really rarely see in texts about the war. So much of it, uh, no matter how well written, at least American work tends to be very, it privileges the American experience. It privileges a Western gaze, but to use that Western gaze is, is almost, um, almost inevitably leads one to have a, a violent gaze, right? Because you cannot conceive, like the American exceptionalism cannot conceive of another without conceiving, trying to justify the dehumanizing acts that we must, uh, that one must uh, commit in order to get all that profit, to get that political capital. Um, and I don't really wanna dwell on that because I think it's it's very, clear there are a lot of other academics and writers who can diagnose these problems instead i think i want to choose to plant seeds that kind of grow empathy and compassion because i think that is so much more powerful than leftist a lot of leftist discourse um you know instead of being like i hate you dad <laughs> it's like maybe maybe feeling something about what you're protesting might might be more effective. Thanks. Uh, anyone else has questions for Drew? Please take advantage of her presence because uh, we're gonna have like uh, five minutes more or, or 10 or so, and then uh, we need to release her from the Zoom cage. <laughs> Actually, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I just wanted to really like thank you for sharing this with us, for sharing your experiences in such a beautiful form. Seriously, you moved, you moved me to tears. Uh, but um, I think it's really important for us to like listen to a more emotional um, kind of narrative because even for Afghanistan right now, with everything that's happening, we only um, know things from social media, from uh, news articles, and they're so accepted. Uh, they are so like, you know, uh, simplicity and like they're clear facts. Um, 
they're just so short that because you know we don't have like long attention spans and everything and so like the emotional side goes completely to the background and almost it's almost forgotten um and because of that we actually forget that there are humans and people behind those stories and yeah i really think that what you're doing is is amazing and just i just wanted to say thank you (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for being for your kind words. I mean, I, I agree that that's an important component of it, which is why in my, you know, in the educational work that I do in my own writing, I do privilege the emotional simply because like very often and when we think about kind of structures like binaristic thinking, for example, um, when we think about certain conceptions of the world about gaze, a type of gaze about how all of that informs um, our political discourse. Even for example, like the um, NSC 68, which frames the Cold War as the struggle between good and evil. These, these kinds of ideas, whether we like it or not, are still emotionally driven, but there's not really an acknowledgement of that fact. Um, it might be a hypermasculine emotional drive to power. It might be this emotional drive to power as a way of feeling loved and accepted for, I don't know, a politician. I can only speculate. But emotions are very much at the heart of so much of our political discourse, as evidenced by uh, all of the, the giant mess that we've made for ourselves here in the States, um, like with the Capitol or insurrection on January 6th. Uh, little real discourse, lots of emotion. So if emotion is so central to how we engage with the world, why should we not seek um, emotions that um, remind us of one another's humanity, seek emotions that allow us to hold that sadness, um, allow us to like seek a future, to, to seek out joy, I think, um, if we acknowledge the emotional role in any kind of conversation that we have, be it the little conversations between one another or these bigger foreign policy conversations, then um, I, I, I certainly hope that, you know, we might uh, begin to change. Um, literature's tricky that way. It's not like a bill on the House of the uh, Senate floor can't just change things like a like like that. Instead, it's it's kind of slow moving, but um, in a lot of ways, um, I don't know. I just it's important to me to do this. If that's the only reason I do it, then I guess that's enough. Um, Are there any other questions? <laughs> you can ask me awkward questions too. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, I, I'm I'm dying oh. to ask you a question that yeah, but if there is uh, someone else, yeah, okay. I think someone else is uh, Georgia. Uh, but she's just commenting like your passion, empathy, as well as your father's were so real and engaging. The way you opened it up was really awesome and inspiring. Thank you. Great. Um, hi, Ezra. Hi. Um, I obviously it doesn't need to be said again, but that was such a beautiful performance. And thank you for uh, participating in this. It was so lovely and uh, amazing to hear. Uh, so I am also a uh, writer and artist, and I really like writing about uh, gender and my own experiences, especially in relation to like the larger structures around me that are like that I am taking place in. Uh, and I was just wondering if you had any advice for like writing about your own experiences and uh, writing about or like making art that is truthful to yourself and uh, trying to express like you live in. Yeah, especially in trying to express these big things. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's an American poet, a uh, spoken word poet, a slam poet um, named Guante. And he says this um, really amazing thing. Um, don't write me a poem about the war. Write me 
uh, write a poem about what it's like to stand in your brother's empty bedroom. And so if we think about this larger project of um, personalizing the political and politicizing the personal, um, it happens not, it doesn't, ever, it doesn't really happen on this like larger national scale, although that's where the decisions are made. Um, the kind of political reflections that we seek um, and those truths, those emotional truths that come with them, they necessarily, I think, have to happen between people um, as part of this kind of larger conversation. Um, the poet, uh, uh, the po poet John Paul says, books are just thick letters to friends. Um, which is to say that it engages in this like larger conversation. And so if we are able to kind of show the political in this deeply personal way, where you may not need to name like, oh, this story is about being trans or this story is about um, moral, um, moral injury, then um, if that's the case, then we might start to become successful. Um, we enter into these little kind of microcosms when we write. And just in the same way that a writer collaborates with an audience, with a reader, um, because of the limitations of language, right? Um, because what I say cannot produce for you smell or hearing or sight or taste or touch you have to help me create that world. So um, if we understand that, then um, we can also understand how like this conversation will like produce that type of empathy. But if that conversation turns into one that's much more like academic and sociological, um, then that isn't necessarily, we don't find each other in those details. Instead, we're writing a poem about the war. We're not writing a poem about what it feels like to stand in our brother's empty bedrooms. Um, but other than that, I mean, like I tell all my writing students, there are no real rules. It's really about finding that right container. And for me, in this project, the right container is a set of fragments, of like fragmented narratives that, you know, one has something to say, it contradicts what follows, there are conflicting interests and mutual interests and, um, you know, uh, and all of them contribute to this larger, like, truth of like, what is it like to be in a family and desire love that's torn away from you, to want to be a woman, to want to be a boy, to want to embrace the man that you love most in the world, to want to get home and start a life. All of these things um, are impossible if, if uh, I feel the language of politics is over inundated in the text. Um, yeah, so centering the self rather than centering kind of the political end um, it, it can be complicated for an activist to have to do that, but ultimately, you know, that's what moves us to activism to begin with. These stories of our friends who've suffered, these stories of people who need our help, and again, those emotions that drive us to that point. <laughs> thank and you. I, I would be excited to read what you have to write. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, thank you again. Of course. Amazing. I think we should invite everyone to John Cabot, uh, uh, maybe in, in the spring or in the fall when the situation uh, is uh, slightly better to have a writer's residency on, on campus. Uh, this would be awesome. I'm inviting yeah. Drew, Ezra, Mackenzie, and um, do something along those lines. That would be really uh, amazing. Um, yeah, and I guess our students also will be very much inspired uh, by uh, what you have to say. Um, yeah, I think we can call it a day. I don't want to keep you in the Zoom room for more than uh, uh, what was expected, uh, but this was uh, really inspiring. Please, everyone, join me in uh, welcoming and thanking uh, Drew Fam for, for being uh, today with us uh, with the, their lecture performance and uh, which will be available uh, on our 
GCU TV channel in a couple of days. So you can rewatch it and uh, follow Drew for updates on their writings. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Drew. It was lovely. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for being here tonight with us. Bye.